Morning everyone, welcome to our worship time this morning, our special Easter worship. Um, great to have everyone online in this very curious online, what's becoming almost normal but feeling it really doesn't seem quite normal. I'll get there. When he, referring to Jesus, came near Jerusalem at the place where the road went down to the Mount of Olives, the large crowd of his disciples began to thank God and praise him in loud voices for all the great things they had seen. God bless the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The band's going to lead in song. We're going to sing the song in Christ alone, which has amazing words. So there's a group here who are going to play. Please feel free to sing wherever you may be, or just reflect on the words. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest droughts and storms. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Please to join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from Mark 14, verses 32 to 43. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. 
He took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. So today um, we're going to do um, a few small reflections on this journey to the cross that Jesus is undertaking. So I am going to speak today to this idea of the Garden of Gethsemane and where Jesus was at in this time on his journey towards the cross. So the week leading up to Jesus' death was a mixed bag of events. He was welcomed into Jerusalem, he washed his disciples' feet, he shared the Last Supper, and then ultimately at this time he knew that he was about to be betrayed so heavily by the people who he loved and trusted um, that it must have been heartbreaking. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he stole away with a few of his closest people and he prayed and the prayer is what I want to focus on today. There are three main things that I want to talk about with this prayer um, to his Abba Father, that everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet now, uh, yet not my will, but yours. So firstly, Jesus prayed a lonely prayer. He withdrew from his friends to seek his Father. He longed to draw nearer to him. This was a tough night for Jesus, the moment that he took upon himself the sins of the world and became the sin bearer. So for me, this is the prelude to the des uh, desertion that he would um, endure in the coming days. His, his friends left him alone. They couldn't stay awake with him, even though he, it says that he was in such deep sorrow. Um, but that was just a small picture of what was to come for him. My second point is that Jesus prayed a son's prayer. He prayed, Abba, Father. So when Jesus taught his followers to pray, he encouraged them to come to God as Father which we have done today in the Lord's Prayer. And he did this himself in his hour of need. Um, for him, this was a prayer asking God to act as a shield for all he was about to face. Jesus, number three, point number three, Jesus prayed a prayer of dedication, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus put aside his own self-preservation and chose obedience to the Father. So what does that mean for us as we prepare for our journey to the cross in this Easter season? So firstly, like Jesus, we need to take time to seek God in prayer and devotion. We are people of the cross and we walk the way of the cross with all of the bumps along the journey. And we're on a bumpy part now. And though it's not always easy, our God is there um, for us, walking with us. Number two, as we pray in the face of our hardships, we come to God as his child. He is our Father. As Jesus did, we can ask God to shield us and comfort us as we walk along the journey. Thirdly, we leave our prayers in God's hands. Jesus is walking the path to the cross with us and we can trust him. 
to keep us safe. Jesus' journey to the cross, however bumpy, is a journey that he chose, and it's the journey of our salvation. We're going to sing a beautiful song now uh, called Lead Me to the Cross um, to prepare our hearts for the next part of this uh, journey um, along the way. from Mark chapter 15 verses 25 to 39. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud, loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to dr Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. 
The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Hi, everybody. Rach here. I guess when we talked about how we'd structure this, we thought we'd set it up like, let's each talk about an element of the, the Holy Week. So Lawrence shared with you about Jesus' journey to the cross, and, and now I guess here we are, sitting at the foot of the cross. So if you will join me, sit down and look up. These are the six hours that changed the world. I hate this part of the Easter story. It's like Titanic. You know what's coming. It's going to be awful. You know it's going to be awful. I hate the injustice of it. I hate that Jesus didn't, shouldn't have been there, but he was. I hate the mockery that he received. I hate the unfairness of it all. And I really hate the passivity that Jesus showed. It bugs me. He could have leapt down off that cross any time he liked. He could have sent an army out. He could have been that Messiah everybody was looking for. He could have got the Romans out of Israel. But he didn't. But the worst thing, to me, is the isolation that Jesus felt. Up there on that cross, his father turned his head away. Jesus became sin up there. And God just couldn't look at him anymore. Jesus felt that distance from his father. Every time he was feeling lonely, he could go up a mountain, go sit and bask in the presence of his heavenly father. And now he was alone. All the pain, all the humiliation, all the mockery, I don't think they compare to the isolation that Jesus felt up there on that cross. And so he ripped out, he called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I know there have been times in my life and I know there are times in your life when you ask the same question. And yet, this empty cross, the fact that he's not up there anymore, it's, it's significant because it means that he made it. It means that he had something in mind. I'm the sort of person who likes escapist movies. I like there to be a happy ending. But I love the sort of film where there's the big twist. And to me, this was the big twist. It's almost like there was a twinkle in Jesus' eye. There's almost like he winked at someone because he knew what he was achieving. He knew what he was there to do. And he did it. And he saw it through. He found the, he, that place, that place of humiliation on the cross was the place of ultimate glory. Jesus found a loophole in God's justice system that says if someone sins, they have to die. Jesus was the loophole. Jesus was God's way of saying, that's still, that's still true, but I'll be the one who dies. So when we ask ourselves, where is God in my loneliness? Where is God in my isolation? He's right up there on the cross. He has been through everything that we are facing and more. Everything we've ever faced. And he did it willingly, out of his love for you and me. I love the Jesus Storybook Bible and um, the writer of the Jesus Storybook Bible talks about God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love. In Hebrews 5 we read, We do not have some high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. So even here at this place of pain and humiliation, we find Christ the King. He brings about joy in this place. He brings about forgiveness in this place. Is there any real worry that you can't lay at the foot of this cross? Is there any sin or attitude or habit that you have that the risen king can't forgive it? Is there any fear that you can't leave behind right here? I'm going to leave you with that. And we're going to sing a song called At the Foot of the Cross. And this, take this as your chance, if you wish, to lay your stuff down at the foot of the cross.
kiss the feet of mercy. I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross, where I am made complete. You have given me taken from Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as Sunday morning was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they trembled and became like dead men. The angel spoke to the women. You must not be afraid, he said. I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly now and tell his disciples he has been raised from death. And now he is going to Galilee, ahead of you. There you will see him. Remember what I have told you. So they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. But they came up to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Good morning, everyone. Just a few thoughts connected with that reading. Uh, there was one verse that came up on the following slide in particular, um, verse 8. And I'd like to kind of reflect in the light of that verse, which I'll just read that again. So they left, referring to the women, they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Uh, this Easter for us, particularly for those who are Christians, but not just Christians, but for everybody, um, it's something that we've not experienced before, I don't believe. Hey, it's Easter time. We're used to um, being able to go out and about our Easter in a particular way. Our experiences of happy and welcomed holiday times for teachers and people working in schools after a long first term, um, and it's a four-day long weekend, it's a great time that we usually have. Um, my biggest experience of the worst traffic jam ever was people trying to get into Canberra on the East Long Weekend, which that's the, I digress, sorry. But people are used to being in holiday mode and having fun and enjoying themselves. It's a time to get away. It's a time to get together with family and friends. Um, many families have long-standing Easter traditions. There's certain places they'll go to at Easter time so they can get together. 
Uh, and of course, there are hot cross buns and Easter eggs, which we can still enjoy. We've been able to enjoy them since January, which is kind of interesting, <laughs> but that's, that's good too. So our normal experience of Easter is all of that really nice stuff, being together. Particularly for Christians, this Easter is like nothing we've ever experienced, at least many of us, for years, ever. We can't even go to church. We can't have the sacrament. We can't get together as Christians to celebrate Easter Sunday. What's with that? Yes, we're um, adapting and doing some online church, and that's, that's a great blessing. But from what we're used to, this, our usual experience of Easter, um, this is our experience this year is unlike anything anyone's experienced before, anything we've experienced before. We can't share time with family, we can't go on our usual holidays, and we can't go to church. We'll gather in the one place. It's not more than two, or a family. This Easter, the reality is many people may well be feeling alone because we're also isolating ourselves. We're physically distancing ourselves from one another. Um, many people are afraid, wondering what's ahead. Um, many may be feeling um, this isolation of physical distance and not being able to contact family and friends at this time. For some people, they're going through a terrible grieving process um, connected with a lot of these things, but also if people, and we're thinking globally, so many people are going through awful grief at this time because they've lost loved ones. This is an experience, surely, of Easter that no one has experienced before. Why have they? Let's look at the Easter readings. It's been very interesting for me, kind of reflecting on this, these texts in this context, and that's the way God works with us in our hearts often. Just that verse again. So they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. I wonder if perhaps for the first time, many of us are experiencing what those present at the first Easter were feeling. You read how the Gospels describe this. Here's a group of people who had been followers of Jesus. He was their answer. They watched him die. A horrible death. They were in grief. More than grief. They were devastated, a lot of them. The disciples were feeling shame because they'd run and they were in lockdown. They were in hiding and they were dead scared. Even the women going to the tomb, seeing what was happening there. It's interesting, the description in the Gospels talks about their initial response was they were terrified, they were fearful, seeing angels and what else was going on. It's interesting that when we look at the first Easter, what were people experiencing? They were experiencing isolation, fear, grief. They were in lockdown. They were terribly afraid. This was their experience of Easter. It's not the kind of thing we're used to experiencing, but for some of us, for the first time, we're experiencing those things. Now that may seem, oh, what are you telling us that for, Pastor Robin? Thanks for making us feel great. But here's the kicker. In that circumstance, what goes on? In that circumstance, God is right there. Where's God? God's there. And God's doing miracles. God's love is right there with people. He's actually raising the dead. He's changing people's hearts. He's bringing people together. Um, God is doing the miraculous. That God who is love and God's love and his grace, that's what it does. That's what he does. In times of trouble, in times when things seem the worst, that's when God works miracles and does extraordinary things. And if you look at Jesus' life and what was going on and people's experiences of him and encounters with him, that's what God was doing all along in Jesus. He was going to the people who were outcasts, those who were suffering terrible diseases like leprosy, those who were feeling rejected, those who were going through grief. And God, in those circumstances, did extraordinary things and miraculous things in the lives of people and in the hearts of people and in really interesting ways bringing people together, people of faith and people, random people of no faith because of his grace. So this Easter, yep, while experiences are quite not what we're used to, uh, I think it's a, in an interesting way gives us this way of tapping into what was going on in the first Easter and something that doesn't change is the way God's love and God himself intervenes and interacts in that space. Performing miracles, sharing his love, caring for people, bringing people together, raising the dead, raising spirits and changing lives. And that's the nature of God and Easter. 
Okay, we've got um, a bit of a gift now. Um, yeah, during the term, the senior singers uh, learnt ready to perform for our special worship, um, which would have been yesterday with the college, um, a beautiful song called God's Son of the World. a little bit because we would love for this to be a bit of an interactive time so we're going to ask you if you would be willing to type in a couple of words I'm going to just guide us in a few different areas of life at the moment so we're going to um, I'm, I'm really not going to ask you to close your eyes I'm going to ask you to check out the chat right now so as we begin I want you to start by thinking of something that you're grateful for that you might be able to type in one line a few words so we're going to have a prayer time um, and it's going to be pretty much a silent prayer time. I'll guide it and you guys can pray it on the chat screen. I hope that makes sense. Lord, we come to you now as a community, as a community of people who care about you, people who are so grateful to you for what you've done. And we take this time now to share our thanks. take this next amount of time to present our requests to God, to ask him for those things that are on our hearts, whether they are specific things or more general. Obviously, you don't need to go into too much detail, but if you would like to share something that you would like to ask God for, ask God to intervene, people that you care about or situations in the world, obviously there's a lot going on. So. Lord, we just lift up to you our requests now because we know you are listening and we know you have power. The final thing I'm going to ask you to do is to maybe just share in a few words. It might be a challenge to just share it in a few words. Uh, a few words of praise. If I were talking to the junior school students, I'd say, what's your favourite thing about Jesus? What's something that we can praise him for? What element of his personality, what characteristic, what do you appreciate the most about Jesus? Maybe just put something like that. Lord, we lift all of these prayers and thoughts to you, knowing that you are always listening, knowing that you are right beside us, knowing that you, through the Holy Spirit, are inside us. Keep us listening to you. Keep us talking to you. Keep us reaching out to your people. Help us to keep on pointing each other towards you, to your friendship, to your life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Thank you for joining us for worship today. We're almost at the conclusion. Um, we're going to ask God's blessing. Um, as we go our respective ways, whatever we're doing today and during the time of holidays till we come back we ask God's blessing knowing that wherever we go God is present with us and that his love is there holding us so tightly um, the benediction is from scripture now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.